Hi everybody and welcome back to our last election story time. Today is election day and today is the day of our literary presidential election. So if you haven't gone over and voted in that yet, please go do so. So for this last one, this is a non-fiction book that we're going to read and it's called The Next President, The Unexpected Beginnings and Unwritten Future of America's Presidents. So this book is going to tell us all about past presidents and our current president that we have. And it's talking about the next president. And we don't know yet who our next president is going to be. We don't know if it's going to be the president that we have right now and he's going to get elected again or if it's going to be somebody new who is going to be the next president. So this book is by Kate Messner and Adam Rex and we're going to learn a little bit about our nation's presidents. This is a really long book, so I might have a little bit of trouble, you know, it might go off the screen a little bit so I can read it, but I'll be sure to hold it up so you can see all the pictures anyway. Quick, name the president of the United States. You can name it, you can yell it out yourself if you know it. No matter when you read this book, there's only one right answer to that question because America only has one president at a time. Some already know they'd like to run the country one day. Some are learning how government works as members of Congress or representatives in state, local, or student government. And some don't have any clue yet that one day they'll be president. When George Washington became the first president of the United States, there were nine future presidents already alive in America. Four of them were working alongside Washington in the nation's new capital. President number two, John Adams, was Washington's vice president. Adams was known for having a short temper and getting into arguments. He was the only one of the first five presidents who didn't enslave people. So he's number two, he's got this number two on him right here. So George Washington's up here. This is number two, this is John Adams. President number three, Thomas Jefferson, served as Secretary of State. In 1776, he had written the Declaration of Independence, which includes the words, all men are created equal, even though Jefferson enslaved hundreds of people on his Virginia plantation. This is Jefferson. He doesn't look like too happy of a person, does he? President number four, James Madison, had grown up on a plantation in Virginia and now represented that state in the nation's new Congress. Madison wasn't always easy to hear with his quiet voice, and he ended up being America's smallest president. Madison was five feet four inches tall and only weighed about 100 pounds. Well, he was only as tall as me. So if you know how tall Miss Christie is, he was only as tall as me. And he's right here. He's number four. President number five, James Monroe, had run for Congress too, but he'd lost to Madison. Monroe would be elected to the Senate the following year. Like many other future presidents, he'd intended to study law in college, but he dropped out to join the army. So he's got a number five on, so that's what all of these people look like. Okay, so we started in 1789, and it, here, it says here too, 1789, at the time of Washington's inauguration, Presidents 6 and 7 were both practicing law. President 6 was John Quincy Adams, who was about to open his own legal practice in Boston. As a boy, he traveled overseas with his father to ask France for help during the Revolutionary War. President 7 was Andrew Jackson, was living in a boarding house in Nashville. Jackson was the son of Irish immigrants. His father had died before he was born, and he'd grown up with a reputation as an outsider with a furious temper. I think I'm going to switch sides for this. This is a very long book, and it's, it's hard to hold up. While Presidents 8, 9, and 12 were all kids, Presidents 10 and 11 hadn't been born yet. 
So present number eight, Martin Van Buren was seven years old helping with chores on his parents' farm in Kinderhook, New York. President nine, William Henry Harrison was 16 years old and studying medicine. And President 12, four-year-old Zachary Taylor was living with his two older brothers on the Kentucky farmland his father had been given for serving in the Revolutionary War. Snapshot. After 19 years in law and politics and another 23 years before he'd be president, Andrew Jackson was running a Tennessee cotton plantation. He'd been in fights and duels before, but this time it was more serious. It all started when a man named Charles Dickinson accused Jackson of cheating on a horse bet and insulted Jackson's wife. Dickinson fired the first shot and hit Jackson close to his heart, but before Jackson fell, he fired back, killing Dickinson. The bullet that hit Jackson was too close to his heart for doctors to remove, and Jackson would carry it with him all the way to the White House in 1829. So don't ever let people tell you the history isn't cool because this is pretty cool stuff. All right, let's flip on this side because there's another snapshot. Snapshot. 33 years before he would be president, Abraham Lincoln was on his way to New Orleans working on a Mississippi River boat full of farm produce. Lincoln cooked, navigated, and did whatever else was needed to help out. We are now in 1841. When William Henry Harrison became president nine, there were 14 future presidents alive. Most of them were already involved in politics somehow. President 10, John Tyler, had worked as a lawyer, congressman, and senator before he was elected to be Harrison's vice president. Some historians have called Tyler the accidental president because he had to take over when Harrison died of pneumonia just 31 days into his term. President 11, James K. Polk, had a setback that year. He had been governor of Tennessee, but didn't get reelected. He lost to six foot tall, two, I'm sorry, six foot two, 125 pound man with the nickname Lean Jimmy Jones. Polk didn't give up on politics though. He started talking with people about his desire to be nominated for vice president. And president 23, little Benjamin Harrison, who was seven years old, wasn't actually there for the inauguration, but probably wish he could have seen that moment. He must have been proud when his grandpa, William Henry Harrison, took the oath of office. And little Zachary Taylor, president 12, was grown up and serving in the military now. So we're kind of jumping all over the place. In 1841, Presidents 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 were all serving in the government then. President 13, Millard Fillmore, who'd grown up as a quiet bookworm in central New York, was in Congress. President 14, Franklin Pierce, had been serving as a senator, but left Washington in 1841 to go home to New Hampshire at his wife's request. President 15, James Buchanan, was in the Senate in 1841, 16 years later, he would become the only president who never got married. President 16, Abraham Lincoln, was serving in the Illinois legislature then. He'd done lots of other jobs before that. As a young man, Lincoln built things, sold groceries, did farm chores, and rode a ferry boat. And President 17, Andrew Johnson, was elected to the state senate in Tennessee. He'd moved there with a cart and a pony way back in 1825, after he ran away from the tailor to whom he'd been apprenticed. We're still in 1841. Presidents 18 and 19 were both in college in 1841. President 18, Ulysses S. Grant, was attending the United States Military Academy at West Point, preparing for his time in the armed forces. President 19, Rutherford B. Hayes, was studying at Kenyon College, preparing for a career in law. He had a reputation as a pretty good cook, even though cooking in student rooms was against the rules. 
Presidents 20, 21, and 22 were all busy growing up. President 20, James Garfield, was working on an Ohio farm with his brothers and his mom. President 21, Chester A. Arthur, was in school, but he moved around a lot with his father, a preacher who traveled from town to town. President 22 and later President 24, Grover Cleveland, also had a dad who was a preacher. His family traveled from church to church too. Wherever he could, he snuck away to fish. For President 23, see page 14. So we've already talked about President 23. And fun fact about President 21, Chester A. Arthur, I'm related to him. He's a cousin, it's like a far, far, far away cousin, but I'm actually related to him. I bet some of you are even related to presidents as well. And you just don't know it. Oh, we got another snapshot. So this is a pretty fancy one here. So snapshot, after serving the Illinois General Assembly and losing a race for US Senate, Abraham Lincoln finally made it to the White House and brought along two goats, Nanny and Nanco. Nanny used to get in trouble for eating blossoms out of the flower beds. Lincoln wasn't the only president with a penchant for pets. Warren Harding had an Airedale named Laddie Boy who used to attend cabinet meetings with the president, the doggy. When Calvin Coolidge was in the White House, Mrs. Coolidge had a raccoon named Rebecca that she took for walks on a leash. Oh my goodness. And then there was William Johnson Hippopotamus, nicknamed Billy, a pygmy hippo the president received as a gift in 1927. Billy ended up spending most of his life at the National Zoo. That's in Washington. Theodore Roosevelt's White House visitors might have met Bill the Lizard, Ma the Pig, Josiah the Badger, Baron Spreckle the Hen, or Peter the Rabbit. The Roosevelts also had a hyena and a barn owl, some ducks in the fountain, an Icelandic pony named Algonquin, a small bear named Jonathan Edwards, and a handful of snakes. One of the snakes belonged to first daughter Alice, who said she named it Emily Spinach because it was green and as, and as thin as her Aunt Emily. Meanwhile, Thomas Jefferson and William McKinley were partial to birds. Jefferson had a mockingbird named Dick who perched on his shoulder sometimes while he worked, and McKinley had a parrot named Washington Post who could supposedly whistle the song Yankee Doodle Dandy. We are now in 1897. When President 25, William McKinley, moved into the White House with his vice president, Garrett Hobart, there were nine future presidents alive. President 26, Theodore Roosevelt, was serving as assistant secretary of the Navy. It might not have seemed very exciting after his wild years as a cattle rancher in the badlands of South Dakota, but before long, Roosevelt would get a bigger job. He'd become vice president after the death of Garrett Hobart. President 27, William Howard Taft, was serving as a judge and teaching at the University of Cincinnati Law School. Taft was a big man who had a reputation as a fighter and a wrestler when he was growing up. Other future presidents were busy with different jobs. President 28, Woodrow Wilson, was teaching at Princeton University and liked to ride his bike around campus. President 29, Warren G. Harding, was running the Marion Star, an Ohio newspaper he'd purchased with two friends. President 30, Calvin Coolidge, was working as a lawyer in Northampton, Massachusetts. He learned all about how hard work helping out in his father's general store when he was a kid. He'd worn his hair on the long side in college, but he had it cut short when he took the job in law and realized what serious work he would be doing. President 31, Herbert Hoover, had studied enge engineering in college and was managing a gold mine operation in Australia. In, 19, in 1897, Presidents 32, 33, and 34 were kids. President 32, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was 15 and loved sailing when his family vacationed in Maine. Roosevelt was a collector, too. He kept detailed notebooks about his postage stamps, bird nest, and egg collections. President 33, Harry Truman, who was turning 13 that year, played piano and loved to read, especially biographies. Later on, before he became president, he would work as a timekeeper for a railroad gang and spend time farming cows and pigs. 
President 34, seven-year-old Dwight D. Eisenhower, was helping out in the family garden with his brothers. The boys also worked at their father's creamery after school. When he had free time, Dwight liked to play baseball and football. We got another snapshot. Theodore Roosevelt wins the prize for president who had the most adventures on his way to the White House. After he finished law school, he took off for Europe and climbed the Matterhorn in the Alps. He moved out west for a while, bought a ranch in South Dakota, and spent his time riding, roping, and hunting. Even after Roosevelt became vice president in 1901, he snuck off to explore. He was climbing Mount Marcy, the tallest peak in the Adirondacks, when a messenger arrived to tell him President William McKinley had taken a turn for the worse after being shot by an assassin in Buffalo. Roosevelt left for Buffalo the next day, but McKinley died before he got there. Roosevelt was sworn in as president before he could even unpack his bags. At 42, at, he became the youngest president to take office. In 1961, oh, wait, is that the right page? Yeah. In 1961, it was President 35, John F. Kennedy, who was the youngest person to be elected to the job. Kennedy was 43 years old when he took the oath of office. The next 10 presidents were alive then too, scattered all across the country. President 36, Lyndon Baines Johnson, was serving as JFK's vice president. That was a fancier job than others he'd held. As a kid, Johnson had shined shoes and picked cotton. After high school, he moved out to California to pick oranges and wash dishes to earn money for college. President 37, Richard Nixon, had served as vice president under Dwight D. Eisenhower and hoped to be president next. But he lost the 1960 election to Kennedy, so he left the White House and moved back to California. Many people think that our nation's first televised debates had a big role in Nixon's defeat. TV was new then. Nixon didn't practice as much as Kennedy did, and he also refused to use professional makeup, even though he'd been in the hospital recently. After the first debate, his mom called him on the phone to ask if he was feeling all right. And over here it says, I'm fine, mom. In 1961, President 38, Gerald Ford, was serving in Congress. He'd come a long way from his awkward teenage years when he bought his first car, a $75 Ford Coupe with a rumble seat, and promptly set it on fire by covering the hood with blankets on a winter night while the engine was still hot. President 39, Jimmy Carter, was running a peanut farm in Georgia and serving on his local school board. President 40, Ronald Reagan, was working as a TV host. Before becoming president, he had also announced play-by-play -play sports on the radio, acted in movies, and served as governor of California. President 41, George H.W. Bush, would lead the nation for, wouldn't lead the nation for another 28 years, but in 1961, he was the president of an oil exploration company called Zapata Offshore. In 1961, Presidents 42, 43, 44, and 45 were all kids. President 42, Bill Clinton, was 15 years old and going to school in Arkansas, where he loved debate and playing tenor saxophone. In 1963, he would be chosen as a delegate to Boys Nation, where he'd meet President Kennedy and shake his hand. President 43, George W. Bush, 41's son, was 15 in 1961 and attending prep school in Massachusetts. By senior year, he'd signed up for the cheerleading squad. President 44, Barack Obama, was born that year and the son of an American woman and a Kenyan man who'd met at the University of Hawaii. Their little boy would grow up to be the first African-American president of the United States. And President 45, Donald Trump, was a teenager then. He was attending New York Military Academy where his father had hoped he'd learn some discipline. And where is the next president now? It's exciting to think about, isn't it? The truth is America's earliest presidents 
weren't all that different from one another. Most were wealthy white Protestant men who might have been surprised if they'd been around to see a Catholic or an African American man elected president, or a woman nominated by a major party for the highest office in the land. But all those things have happened because America is always changing and it is changing now. When voters choose the next president, hint, hint, that's today, they won't look to the past, but to the future and the ever hopeful vision of what America could be. So where is the next president? At least 10 of our future presidents are probably alive today. If we go by the odds, three of them are likely serving in government somewhere already. One is in college or in the military. Three probably have other jobs, perhaps practicing law, building things, teaching, running a business. And at least three of our future presidents are kids. What are they doing right now? They might be solving math problems or reading books, writing poetry or code, testing hypothesis or learning to dance, making art or making change. For now, they're busy growing up, growing into the job, listening, learning, and getting ready to lead. Then this one says presidential birthplaces. I'm gonna show you the map and then I'm gonna turn it around so I can actually read the words. So all the little stick people that look like the game of life people, they mark a president's birthplace. If you can find Pennsylvania, which I can't really see over top of my thing here. Okay, so here's Pennsylvania and there's only one marker in it. So that means there's only one president that came from Pennsylvania. So this says Americans, America's presidency goes all the way back to 1789 when there were only 12 states in the union. So it makes sense that the oldest states have produced the most presidents, except for Pennsylvania, which is weird because you would think we would have more, but we don't. Virginia leads the list as the birthplace of eight presidents. Ohio comes in second with seven, while New York produced five presidents. Four presidents were born in Massachusetts, while North Carolina, Texas, and Vermont each produced two. South Carolina, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, New Jersey, Iowa, Missouri, California, Nebraska, Georgia, Illinois, Arkansas, Connecticut, and Hawaii have each sent one president to Washington. So far, America hasn't had any presidents who were born in Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Colorado, Delaware, Florida, Idaho, Indiana, Kansas, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, Montana, Nevada, New Mexico, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Oregon, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Tennessee, Utah, Washington, West Virginia, Wisconsin, or Wyoming. So is that 29 states? Did I count 29 states? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 5, 26, 27, 28, 29 states. We haven't had a president come out of 29 states. Huh, that's more than half. We have 50 states and 25 is half of 50. So there are more than half the states where we've never had a president come from that state. Here's a little bit more um, information and then this story time is done. I know this one has been very long, but this is the important one. This is the one on election day. So presidential requirements, all of America's presidents so far have been men, most of them white men, but that has to do with history, power, and privilege rather than the actual rules about who can be president. The requirements to be president of the United States are explained clearly in the Constitution. None of them have to do with your gender, whether or not you have a disability, the color of your skin, where your ancestors are from, what you believe, or who you love. No person, except a natural born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this constitution shall be eligible to the office of president. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years and been 14 years a, re a resident within the United States. So that's the actual terminology. What that means is in order to be president, the person has to have been a citizen of the United States at birth 
So there's a couple rules about that. It, you either have to be born in the United States in a state, or you have to be born, I think it's to at least one Native American parent somewhere else overseas. I think it's just one parent. I don't think it has to be both. You have to be at least 35 years old. So I'm not even old enough to be president yet. I am not 35, so I'm not even old enough. And most of you probably are not either. And you have to have lived in the United States for at least 14 years. So you have to have been born here and you have to live here for at least 14 years. So if you were born here and then you move to, you know, Ireland when you were three and you've never moved back to the United States and you have not lived here for more than three years, you couldn't be president. You have to have lived here for 14 years as well. The changing face of American presidency says, in 2009, Barack Obama took his oath of office as America's first African-American president. He was reelected to a second term in 2012. In 2016, Hillary Clinton became the first woman to be nominated for president by a major political party. She lost the election to Donald Trump. In the following midterm elections, more than 100 women were elected to Congress, the greatest number ever. Many of them were inspired by Hillary Clinton's near victory. So that is all I have for you in this book. The only other two pages, um, this is called the bibliography. And that just means these are all the sources, books, articles, different things that they use to get the information that goes into this book. Because this is a nonfiction true book. So that is the end of our election story time. With today being election day, we do hope that you vote in the literary presidential election and you pay attention to what happens tonight or possibly maybe tomorrow or even over a couple of days as they count all the votes so that you see what happens in the real United States and who becomes our next president or gets another term as our current president. It could go either way. So we hope that you've enjoyed these election story times. We hope you've learned a little bit about how government and politics and elections work. And we can't wait to see you back at the library soon. Have a great day.